Welcome to our pre-recorded author event. I'm Lisa. I'm the Reader Development Librarian for Suffolk Libraries, and I'm so pleased to introduce the fabulous and wonderful author, Kate Thompson. Welcome, Kate, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for having me on. I love that. I love that build-up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to first off ask you, like Kate, obviously you're an award-winning journalist. You spent over 20 years working for national newspapers. Did you always want to be an author at some point? Oh, God. Do you know, I get that, asked, that question quite a lot, and, and I always think people expect me to say yes, but I absolutely didn't. I never, I never in a million years thought that I could be an author, which sounds a bit weird, but I think it kind of tracks back to when I came out of school, um, can I put it? School didn't really work out for me particularly well. I came out with one GCSE. I didn't feel sort of educated, if you like. And in my mind, I'd always loved stories. I'd always loved reading. And as a kid, I was always that kid with the head in the book on wherever I was on holiday, you know, every spare moment I, I had, I was reading. And um, so I love stories and I love storytelling, but I just didn't, never felt, um, I suppose, educated, if you like. And so in my head, you know, the people that wrote books had gone to university and they'd done degrees and they were possibly Oxbridge educated. So I kind of parked it in my head. It was just a dream too big, if you like. Um, so my route into it really was through becoming a journalist. So I left school with my woeful lack of education. Um, I managed to get some work experience in my local paper and I loved it. I just fell in love with journalism. I, I kind of found my niche, if you like. And so I spent 20 years working in Fleet Street um, for magazines and newspapers. And then when I was pregnant with my second son, my, um, I got made redundant. I was thinking, oh God, what, what am I going to do now? Um, and I needed something that fitted around childcare and so forth. And a friend of mine was working as a ghostwriter and she said, oh, you should try this, Kate. You know, you, you'd like it. You know, publishers are desperate for journalists to, to work as ghostwriters. So to cut a long story short, that's what I did. And I got into ghostwriting and it was really only through actually writing other people's books that I began to see, well, actually maybe I could write a long form narrative as they call it. And it didn't become so kind of um, unachievable in my mind. So, so that's what really happened after five books, my agent said, why don't you try writing your own book? And I kind of laughed and thought, yeah, whatever, I'll, I'll give it a go, but that's what I did. Um, and I wrote this first novel with my agent and, you know, her checking it and editing it along the way. <clears throat> and I really wrote it as if, um, I, re I read this brilliant quote by Stephen King. He wrote, obviously he's written many, many books, but he wrote a fantastic book about the art of writing or the craft of writing. Yeah. And in it, he said, always write your first draft as if the door is shut. And that's what I did with my book. I wrote it as if the door was shut. And so it enabled me to, I don't know, just let my imagination come out and just enjoy it. And so that's really... A very long-winded way of saying <laughs> no I never expected to write a book but that's how it came came to be I suppose. And that first book Kate that you just mentioned obviously Secrets of the Singer Girls like how did that feel when it did finally happen when you got that published? Um, again terrifying if I can be totally honest with you I was absolutely I was absolutely sort of it was almost like an out-of-body experience when my agent rang me and said oh Kate the books <clears throat> it's gone in a bidding war there's a five-way auction for it i was just it, it, it really was i was completely and utterly flabbergasted and then when i think when it sunk in i've got this thing which i know a lot of women sort of suffer with this so-called imposter syndrome um, yeah. and i don't think it's exclusive to women i think men suffer from it too but 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 it seems to be predominantly women and i just had this feeling like oh my god i'm going to get found out they're going to realize why have they bought this book you know why am i writing this book and so when I look back on that time, um, a lot of it is shrouded with memories of sort of fear and, and, and panic about how was I going to do this. But, but, but overall, I was, of course, I was thrilled. I was very happy to have this book out, but it was, it was overwhelming, I suppose, to, to begin with, is the, is the best thing. It's way. like, as you say, like lots of mixed emotions, isn't it? You know, yeah, you've got the yeah. excitement and the surrealness, but then also like, I can't believe this is actually happening. Yeah, and of course, because, you know, when you're a ghostwriter, you're, you're kind of, and a journalist, you're used to working behind the scenes. Your face is never out there. And suddenly my name was on the book and my picture was there and I was working on press releases and I suddenly got a, a publicist assigned to me. And I thought, wow, this is not something I suppose I was prepared for. Um, and, you know, since then I've really begun to question that whole narrative around, you know, the, the whole imposter syndrome, because I think it's really important. And actually, in retrospect, it's been the best thing that's ever happened to me. But that's where I was with it at, at that moment. So, you know, delight tempered with terror. 
<laughs> well, then that book obviously went on to have amazing sales. It became a Sunday Times bestseller. That just must be another layer of like surrealism for you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You say that another layer of surrealism. That's that's absolutely perfectly captured how it felt. I remember reading the email and just thinking, oh my God, all that, you know, I had never, I didn't have any expectations about what the book was going to sell. I didn't have any expectations about it at all. I kind of just went into it hoping for the best. So when I got that um, email sent, it had sold 10,000 the first week. I was again, just stunned. But one of the loveliest things of it was actually, I have to say, was sharing it with my mum and dad because I'd been such a difficult, streperous teenager and I was a nightmare to have it around. To actually sit down and open a bottle of champagne with them and celebrate it really for me was was one of the loveliest things of it actually was sharing that with them and you know almost saying sorry mum and dad but well, one GCSE in the way I what a nightmare teenager I was <laughs> so yeah that was the lovely side of it I guess that being able to share that joy with my mum and dad and I think like as the time goes by it becomes that what was once surreal starts becoming almost more normal doesn't it and then you go on to the next book and the next book and obviously your latest book Kate <laughs> Secrets of the Lavender Girls which is superb I've already been saying to Kate how much I enjoyed it oh, but for, for those watching that haven't yet discovered this brilliant book Kate could you give them a little bit of a taste of what to expect yeah, yeah. so I suppose like all my books it's essentially it's just a big old slice of, of social history which is what I love um, and it's set at the iconic Yardley factory um, in Stratford during the second world war and one of the funny things with this book I hadn't been expecting I suppose was how much um, scent is bound up it's so evocative isn't it it's so bound up with memory and the way we we re remember things and so when the first book came out which was Secrets of the Homefront Girls, Lavender Girls is the sequel to it, I had so many emails from people going oh my god this book reminds me of my nan or my gra you know or my auntie or my mum and I remember the smell of Yardley's lavender and I think it really opens up those pathways in the brain that we associate with with memory but mm -hmm. going back to the book I think one of the things I loved most about it and I wanted to explore was the fact that the Yardley's was very much a kind of prestigious brand back then it had been founded in 1770 you know it was one of the big British brands um, of the second around the time of the second world war and a lot of the products were packed in there or were sold in their very plush um, showroom up in Bond Street <clears throat> excuse me but they were packed in this real sort of noxious industrial backwater which was Stratford or otherwise known as Stinky Stratford um, and a lot of my previous books are set in places like Bethnal Green or Bow and there's almost a sort of um I suppose like a romance or a mythology associated with those areas, fueled by images of foggy lamplit streets and the legends of the craze and Jack the Ripper, where Stratford's always to me felt a bit of a scruffy outsider. But I yeah. absolutely fell in love with Stratford. I went along and I interviewed lots of people and, and began to realise that, that, that Stratford is very much the noxious industrial heartland of, Stratford, of, of East London. And it's a place where people felt really proud to come from and, and produce goods and services that the whole country used. You know, they produced everything from gas and acids and paints and they used to boil up bones for the, um, for the soap and oxo and you can imagine this is why it was it was called stinky stratford and a lot of this industry was uh, focused on a very long city street called carpenters uh, carpenters road or otherwise known as stink bomb alley a, type, a place where somebody said to me there were seven different types of air used to blow depending on which way the wind was blowing <laughs> and, I love, and i love and i remember once um ages ago before I even became an author listened to an interview with Jilly Cooper on Desert Island Discs and she said all good writing needs to engage all the senses you know what do things taste like what do they smell like what do they sound like and for, for a writer something like Stratford it's just it's an absolute gift it's it's so visceral you know I imagine myself walking down Stink Bomb Alley and I can hear the the factory hooters going off and all the girls are hitching lifts on the back of the you know the back of the trucks that rattle down there and you know, these great clouds of noxious yellow smoke and then in the center of this you've got this beautiful lavender scented oasis that is the Yardley factory and 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 Yardley's I mean wow you know what couldn't couldn't we do with a kind of firm like that today you know they were incredibly um paternalistic and they really looked after their staff so to be a lavender girl as they were called was considered a real fun job I mean the, you know I guess if you're a young girl you know you don't want to go and work in the Oxo factory or the Sprats the dog food you want to work in <clears throat> what's considered the glamorous firm which is which is Yardley's and they really looked after their staff there as one girl said to me it was almost like our East End finishing school and it was a rite of passage to go into this paternalistic factory and um yeah they really looked after their staff they had you know weekly uh you know they had um 
dinners, dances, they had beanos down to the coast. Um, there was uh, social and welfare sports clubs. They used to wheel in an x-ray. This is pre-NHS days. They used to wheel an x-ray for free x-rays for the girls to check that they were healthy. Um, and apparently if you had the tidiest conveyor belt, you, you could be awarded the, uh, the best housekeeping award and you'd be sent to the Bond Street Beauty School for a free makeover. So all the girls clamoured to work there. It really was the, the plum place to work. And I think that's what I wanted to explore was those feelings of that this was more than a job. It was a way of life, a continuation of their education, um, but a way of life for these girls and, and, and offering up enormous camaraderie and community and a sense of belonging that many of these women, you know, a lot of the lavender girls that I interviewed who started working there straight from school, you know, age 14, are now in their 90s and they still love that place they still I don't think mentally they've kind of clocked off it holds a very special sort of place in their heart place in their heart almost yeah, isn't it yeah there will always be a lavender girl there was such a sense of pride associated with it and that was what I wanted to try and encapsulate just some of that enormous you know the tight-knit communities and also pitted against the sort of the danger and, and the tension of, of the second world war and and their role actually in the beauty is your duty campaign which I don't know if you want to talk about, but that's that for me is fascinating as well. Well, I mean, you said already about like the interviews you've done, obviously research for um, your <laughs> amazing book. But I, I, was, I said I've really enjoyed it. You spoke to Jill and Joan about, you know, for research for the book. Would you tell our audience a little bit about that experience? Yeah. So for, for me, research is everything. If I could do nothing but research, I'd be very happy. I'm, I'm always happiest perched on someone's front room with a cup of tea in my hand, listening to that incredible, and it is always incredible, sort of undiluted gush of social history that you always get when you sit down with somebody, you know, face to face. And so uh, Jill and Joan actually didn't work at, at Yardies, they worked at a place called The Windmill. So I've got one of my characters, Patsy, who is, a, is sort of working on the conveyor belts by day, but at night she's working at the notorious uh, Windmill Theatre, which was in Soho. And I don't know how many people know about this place, but it was extraordinary. It was, um, and I've long been obsessed with it and I kind of wanted to weave it into the book as a way of injecting some glamour away from stinky mm. Stratford. Um, so the Windmill Theatre was one of the few theatres in wartime not to close its doors. So the strap line or its sort of marketing slogan was we never closed, but it got changed over time by journalists to we never clothed because of the, <laughs> I because, like that. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was quite, I mean, now looking back, it was very, it, it's quite innocent compared to today's standards. But back then they had these beautiful women posing in like tableaus behind the dancers and they were entirely naked. Now the Lord Chamberlain at, at that time, who ran the censorship department decreed that you could only have nudes on stage if they didn't move. So they had to freeze, you know, for 12 minutes for the act, completely naked, and they weren't allowed to move a muscle. And if they moved, it would be enough to get the whole act shut down. And so it was just a fascinating place um, to, to kind of explore and, and, and to, to uncover the glamour. And, and I had preconceptions about that um, theatre. I kind of thought it was a bit, you know, um, I don't know what, what I thought, it was a bit scandalous. But actually talking to Jill and Joan, who worked there just in the immediate post-war years, is they said to me, Kate, well, you have to understand that, that this place was actually, it was sort of a different era. It was naughty, but nice. The girls had to be very wholesome from very good backgrounds. You know, they worked incredibly hard, especially throughout the Blitz. And she said that when the girls were sort of between performances, they used to actually sleep underground in the, in the underground dressing rooms because the Blitz was going on. She said it had something of the feel of a sort of Mallory Towers boarding school. It wasn't quite as salacious as people would think, and, and Vivian Van Dam, who was the owner, um, and Mrs. Henderson, who was the proprietress, were incredibly protective over these girls. So you had all these hordes of GIs, and they turn up at the at the dressing room doors, clamoring to get you know go on dates with these girls, and they're incredibly well protected. So it was great meeting Jill and Joan because although they didn't work there in the war years, they did know a lot of these formidable women that worked there. <clears throat> and we actually went around Soho. We did a little tour of. of the factory and where they used to buy their carmine lipstick and where they would go in their breaks and so forth and it was a very sort of um i think what i love about research is it, it really helps to bring it to life in a way that i don't think you can get through books and, and through films and you know working at the women was a very visceral experience and they they were able to to kind of bring that to life and in fact jill said to me when we were there and i'll read this bit out because it really it really struck me um Jill was a 14 year old convent girl when she had an interview that would change her life and she said 
After I knocked on the door, I was shown up to see Vivian Van Dam, or the old man as he was known. I remember running up flight after flight of stone steps past a flurry of frilled and feathered windmill girls, impossibly glamorous with their carmined lips. And I said to her, what did it smell of? And she said, oh, perfume, sweat and grease paint. She said, but it was the noise that was the most overwhelming. The sound of tap shoes, the humming of sewing machines from the wardrobe department and composers in the music room. And it really, like when she said all this, I was completely immersed. I was taken right back and it brought yeah. the past to life for me in a very sensory way. And I think going back to like what I said before about what um, Julie Cooper said about engaging all the senses. And I think if you can bring that to the page, it kind of gives your writing a bit more immediacy and intimacy. So that's what I'm always striving to bring to make the reader feel like they are actually there in that dressing room or clattering up those stone steps so that's what you know for me interviewing these two grand dams of, of the stage really brought to life and they were fabulous you know they were so um you know they're both in the in their late 70s now and grammars but talk about glamorous i mean my god the deportment and the poise and you know they were still windmill girls in the way that La you know the lavender girls were still lavender girls in their hearts so I felt quite scruffy. <laughs> in oh, bless you. Jill and Joan. <laughs> yeah. Fabulous and glamorous oh. all the time. <laughs> but you obviously continued it after, you know, they the women oh, being windmill yeah. girls stuck oh. with them for life almost. I mean, honestly, you know, they were so incredible. They were telling me about the fan dances and how they used to hold them. And it was so achingly, you know, beautiful. And you look back at that time and and, and the pride that they took and they really helped me to understand as well what that what that theatre meant in terms of morale I think it's impossible to overstate mm. you know there was every single night there was hordes of allied servicemen from around the world from New Zealand and Canada and all over the states and and France and and they were lonely she said you know we, we saw these big brash Americans but she said we knew deep down that these boys were a long way from home and this might be the last show that they ever saw yeah and so they were incredibly lonely and, and, and the windmill was a sort of a home from home and it, and it offered up that, you know, I think, I think during the Second World War, the Ministry of Information spent, must have devoted hours to, to, the, to the sort of thorny subject of morale, you know, how to keep it, how to boost it, how to maintain it. And she said, you know, if they'd just spent a couple of hours hanging out at the windmill, they'd understand how people, um, where they got their morale from and what it meant to people to, to escape. Yeah into that glamorous sort of dark theatre. Well, it's like, even though you just said about this dark theatre, which was the case, but it's almost like it was a haven for people yeah. where, where the servicemen could go to find some sort of connection exactly. with the other troops and obviously having these beautiful, glamorous women on stage. And you've mentioned Patsy, and, uh, you know, I love the characters in the book. They're all really strong and vivid, you know, from her to Lou. It, it didn't really matter which of the women that you described. You know, is that easy for you, Kate? And do you think that part of that is because you do such great research on the people of that time? A hundred percent. Like when I'm writing characters and writing is not the bit where I'm in my comfort zone, as you can probably tell, I'm happiest when I'm out face to face with people. Um, but when I'm sitting down there with these women, I've got suddenly, you know, when I'm writing rather, I've got these strong women and their voices just come into my mind. And, and all these characters, they aren't based on one in particular. I suppose they're a, a mishmash of all of the incredible women that I've met. Um, and it goes back, like the first time I ever met um, East End women, I'll just tell you this story because it really makes me laugh. But when I, uh, all those years ago when my agent suggested that I write a book and, and I wanted to set it in East End because I'd always loved East End. So I went along to interview Vera and Cathy, who are these uh, formidable Bethnal Green women at, this, at their day centre. And I went up and they were these two lovely ladies sort of with grey hair and they were knitting and they told me in detail about Bethnal Green during the Blitz and what it meant to be a Bethnal Greener and, and their pride at remaining in the East End throughout the Blitz. And at the end of the interview, it was a really great interview, I got up to go and she said, oh, wait a minute, darling, we've knitted you something. And I just had my second son at that point. I thought, oh, how sweet. They've knitted baby booties. And they pulled this thing out in soft white wool from their knitting bag and she held it up and it was a willy warmer. And Vera oh, had it just pulled out and I was like, oh my God. And she said, we must have knitted 50 or more of those over the years, babe. And I thought, why? <laughs> but I tell that story because it made, it totally reframed the way that I, I saw East End women and, 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 and older women in general. I, I was, you know, thought, oh, they're really sweet, but they're not. They're irreverent and subversive and funny and mischievous and crafty yeah. and resilient and full of courage and kindness and I think that's always the thing that comes across when I interview women of that generation the enormous 
kindness that they had. And there's a real culture of curiosity. You know, every woman that I've interviewed is as interested in me as I am in them. And, and sort of live by the principles of treat others as you would wish to be treated. And so I've learned a huge amount from these women over the years. Um, and, and also about the true nature of Eastern women and the nature of matriarchy and its importance and influence in Eastern societies and how political a lot of these women were. You know, they were always involved, you know, they, they were always in the heartland of, of, of the struggles for better housing and, and, and improvements in living conditions and so forth, going right back to the 1888 match women's um, strike and then going through the Second World War when they helped to take over the underground as shelter right into the post-war years where we had you know the Dagenham Ford workers fighting for rights in equal pay and so they really a lot of the women I've, been, uh, I've interviewed have been politically motivated and they really impressed that upon me about that these women are so complex and nuanced and, and so and, and so and play such a huge plethora of roles in their communities to keep them running and so it really expanded my mind and opened my mind by going out and interviewing these people and understanding the true nature of matriarchy in the East End and, and what it meant to be an East End woman. So that's what I guess, you know, research has taught me and that's what I'm always trying to be mindful of when I write my characters, you know, who they are and who they're related to and, and how they're standing on the shoulders of giants a lot of the time. And it really does come across because like as well as being able to vividly create this character on the page, they have such strength within them. Very much like you've just been describing, Kate, like just extraordinary, very much know who they are. Um, sometimes they're going on a bit of a journey as well, obviously, but um, fierce. Yeah. like it's they're really inspiring oh god yeah yeah fierce and and strong you know these are the kind of women that stood up at the battle of cable street and you know said no to you know no pass around and said no to fascism you know they're, they're not afraid to tackle to fight for improvements because everything they do is about their children and their community and so you did have women taking part in red strikes and kicking down the doors of bethlehem underground when the blitz was going on to take um you know to, to salvage and i think each, each, and one of the things I also learned is that every neighbourhood or turning had its own chief female. You know, there was always a tough matriarch in a crossover apron and button down boots. And, and I think we were born in the first half of the 20th century before the advent of a welfare state and that institutionalisation of roles. Women played an enormous plethora of roles to keep their communities functioning from, you know, laying out the bodies of the dead to birthing new life, intervening in domestic disputes if they had to... Um, you know, which in a way made me realise that actually these women are more like, you know, without a welfare state, these women were the welfare state. They were a social worker, citizen yeah. advisor, bureau worker, you know, midwife, nurse, doctor, all rolled up in, in one apron. And, and it really began to make me think, well, OK, these women didn't instigate the war. They didn't instigate history, but they were forced to react to it. So I think history and viewed through their eyes takes the true temperature of the times. It's history up close and personal. And that's why I always seek to amplify those voices through my characters, because these women have played an enormous, you know, made an enormous contribution to the social, the economic, the political history of East London. And yet they're never really recognised as such. I feel like we look back and think, oh, well, they were just yeah. housewives. They just worked in a factory when actually their lives were so much more complex and so much more worthy of celebrating than that. I'm sorry I'm going on but I'm repeating no I, I love it because it's very much comes across in your books they're just extraordinary women yeah, and it's yeah. really important to celebrate them and you absolutely. do in your writing which is These are the awesome missing from the history books I'm absolutely passionate about that often I look in the windows of Waterstones and you see these big you know historical books about D-Day and Arnhem and but actually what about the women on the home front you know these women who who were to my mind heroic because you know they're not only raising massive families they're holding down three jobs they're forced to sleep underground so there's a there's a strength and a, and a heroism in that I feel and that's what I wanted to to explore I suppose on the home front through these books and, and you definitely do and you show how adaptable they are as well like when you said about all these different roles they take on course, that they yeah. it's almost like they look at the community and go okay well they need someone to come and do that yeah. and and yet and they do it and they've got that strength yeah. and resilience too yeah. and and you've already said Kate about the characters in your books they're you know they're not based on one person it's like different threads of people you've interviewed but when it comes to actually writing the book do they ever go off and do anything that you don't oh, expect? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's 
it's funny because when you start writing a book, it always feels, and I, I kind of like it in my mind, when you turn out of a party and you don't know anybody and you're making small talk with people. So that's when, you, when I first start writing a book, that's how it feels. It's clunky and it's awkward and you think, God, why am I, oh God, I can't write, you know. And, but you just have to keep showing up day after day, sit at your desk, keep committing to the book and, and writing. And eventually these characters, as you begin to, to research more and you just get into it more and you build up a profile of them and you keep on writing because there's no other way around it, eventually they begin to become more fully fleshed out um, three-dimensional characters and then they go off and do things that surprise you like suddenly you know um, getting in a fight or they might you know decide to, to to start a protest or whatever they do that they go off and you think and that's the magic if I can call it that that's when the magic happens when they do take on a life of their own and start dictating the pace and the narrative to you and that's when I think god that's when I cracked it I, I love that because it's almost like because of who you've based these characters on, they take on the characteristics of those real people where they're feisty, they're no nonsense, they're extraordinary. Mm -hmm. and, and then you start writing about them and they go off and do something like you say, yeah. like start a protest and you're yeah. like, well, I wasn't expecting that, but I'm just going to yeah. roll with it. Exactly. I'm going to roll with it. If that's what needs to be done, then that's what needs to be done. But absolutely. And I, I always say that these women are often a paradox. You know, they're not one thing or another. And I try to keep that up, or those shades of grey within the book that often you know you would have this woman who's the chief female who might be a child-minded by day but who also might perform abortions by night you know they are not one thing or another they are ultimately um you know they've got a lot of common sense but but they played an incredible amount of roles on the, on the in the community and I think we need to understand that the whole, to hold a mirror up to the reality of those days you've got to explore all the aspects of women's lives you know the good the bad the ugly and I try to bring yeah. all that and, and you do that brilliantly and you show all like the layers of their lives and all the things that they're having to cope with and the challenges that they're facing and how they, you know, they stand up to that and in an extraordinary way. And, and one of the things that I've already mentioned to Kate that I absolutely love about the book, um, excuse me, oh no, wrong way, apologies <laughs> everyone, um, The Secrets of Lavender Girls, which is superb, is in the book you explore a lot about, um, you know, love and relationships but also like guilt and forgiveness and the effect it has the, the sort of deep seated effect that it has on people and their lives and how that can affect the decisions they make yeah. and and often as well how they're perceived by others yeah. because of what they're carrying and they can turn into the kind of person they probably never intended yeah. now you know was that a deliberate thing that you find interesting or yeah. something that you you wanted to explore and it, no, not at all. And it's really interesting that you asked me that question because you, you forced me to sort of reflect on that a little bit. I mean, I never really consciously made um, emotions like guilt um, and forgiveness the sort of driver in the book. Um, it, it, obviously, all books need to contain tension, don't they? And I think guilt is a great driver of tension. But then when I began to reflect more deeply on that, I began to think, well, actually, maybe I think what it stems from, I feel, is that that you've got a whole generation, and this is what I've witnessed interviewing and I've heard firsthand interviewing people, a whole generation who have unresolved feelings over the Second World War. They, a lot of the men and women I've interviewed have witnessed great horror and brutality on the home front. You know, they, they've experienced deprivation and privation and suffering, and a lot of that suffering was swept under the carpet in the name of morale, like, you know, the bombing at Canning Town at South Hallsville School where 600 people were killed. And the government put an official estimate of only 73 deaths. They were forced, you know, told it was put, you know, under the official secrets act, and they were told not to talk about it. The same thing happened at Bethnal Green Tube disaster, where 173 people were crushed to death. And so I try to explore those because I feel like they were always told, don't talk about it. And so there was no opportunity to ever share their stories, no acknowledgement of what we would call post-traumatic stress, certainly yeah. no compensation culture. They are what I like to call the just no choice but to get on with it generation. You know, I'd say to people, how did you cope with that? And they were, well, I had no choice. Yeah. It's not being sort of um, self-serving or whatever. It's just they literally had no choice. And so what I think we're looking at is this generation whose, whose pain has never faded, but rather I feel like it's festered. So when I speak to people, yes. so for example, I spoke to this lovely man now in his, his sort of late 80s, Stan, who had to go along to the, the who, who was passing by the 
the school the day after it had been bombed. And he said, and we all knew the council had said 73, West Town Council had said that 73 people had died. But he said, I saw more bodies than that littering the lip of the crater, you know. And he was, this is a, a, a man forced to help pull out the bodies, you know. And he said, Kate, what you have to understand is the working classes were cannon fodder. Another lady I spoke to, Vera, who um, saw the bodies of her friends laid out outside the tube in Bethnal Green after they'd been crushed to death. And she said, my son says to me, mum, you want to forget it, it's done. She said, but in my mind, it's never done. No. And, and the last example of that for me, which really hit home powerfully, um, was this lady that I went to interview at Poplar in a community centre. And she was telling me about her experiences of being evacuated. And she kind of just said in the conversation, she, she confided that she'd been seriously sexually abused while she had been evacuated. Um, and I just, you know, that's not the story that we hear about evacuation, is it? You know, but of course no. it happened and it, and it happened lots. And she said, to, and I said to her, do you still think about it? And she said, every day. And I looked at this woman in her 90s, you know, sitting there in a, doing a crossword at a community. So I thought, how awful that she's never had the chance to process that that pain and that trauma and that brutality that a lot of people had to deal with. And so that's what I, I, I try to instill in this book, the, the, the untold stories of the Second World War, I suppose, the, the stories that were, were glossed over with propaganda at the time, but who mm. is, but was very real for a lot of people who are still living with the effects of it today. And, and another thing that I, I do try to bring in a lot as well is this issue of loneliness. Um, you know, I, a lot of the, the men and women that I speak to often complain of paling into invisibility as they age, as if their memories are somehow like pencil drawings that are being slowly rubbed out. And I find it heartbreaking, you know, because to me, that generation, their stories are the lifeblood of our country. And yet they are often ignored. You know, I, I'll give an example. I was interviewing this lovely lady called Eileen at a cafe, Morrison's Cafe in Stratford. She was a lavender girl. And at the end of the interview, this guy, uh, I, I, you know, this guy walked past her, he smacked into the back of her chair and he looked, he walked on without a backwards glance. And she said to me, you know, Kate, what you have to remember is when you're 80, you're invisible. When you're 90, she said, you might as well be dead. She said, I might have snow on the roof, but I'm not old. I've still got stories to tell. Yeah. And I thought how right she is. And, and I, that's a, something that I feel quite strongly about as well, this, this issue. And there was a survey out actually recently that said apparently, um, there's an estimated something like 9 million people in this country that have admitted to feeling lonely some or all of the time. And I suspect that's only been compounded, of course, with COVID. So, yeah. so these are the themes, I guess, that I, I'm trying to share with you that I, I feel strongly about and I want to hold a mirror up to in my, in my books. And I think what everything you said there is so true, Kate, like it's so important to recognise what people have gone through. And as you say, otherwise it does fester. And you've got you've got these extraordinary characters that have been through very traumatic things. And not only does it live with them forever, it affects future generations. So it affects how they bring up their children and their children and their children. So it's it's affecting all of us to some degree because it's you know, that trauma's almost passed down through generations because of how they then treat their children. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. You're so right. And, and in fact, I, I spoke to, while I was researching the Stepney Doorstep Society, and I spoke to uh, someone who had conducted a survey into evacuation, and I mentioned this lady that had and this terrible experience that she'd had, and he said, well, that trauma is known to pass down through three generations. So in a sense, yeah. we are now living with the effects of the Second World War, as I suppose our children will moving forward after covid but I found Live with that, those I, effects. I never, yeah, I never really thought about how we in, in 2021 are living with the legacy of the Second World War through the women and the men that, that survived it and their experiences. But crucially, I think it's just the fact that they didn't get that opportunity to share their stories. Yeah. And I feel like now we're at a kind of point in history where for so long they didn't talk about it. It was swept under the carpet. You know, life went on let's rebuild you know Britain out of the ashes of the old and, and and life moved on didn't it and there's almost that cliche and you know only fools and horses granddad when he talks about the war it's like oh here we go again you know and people were not encouraged again to talk about it but I feel like we've reached a point now where the need to share overcomes the desire to forget and I see yeah. that, that generation I see men and women in their late 90s just like can't get the stories out fast enough and they're, they're just that it's almost like they're offloading because they know it's their last opportunity to share those stories and I recognize that and I see that it's almost like this time that that window of opportunity to capture these stories is, is closing you know in about five years time there'll be no more room for sort of lively reminiscing with people who can remember a life before the welfare state so the, 
the time to capture it is now, absolutely now. And when you when you said about the only four sources with granddad, one of the things that I also find interesting is often when they do talk about, for example, they war the war, they don't actually talk about their feelings or the trauma. So it's almost like them talking about something that isn't significant is almost them trying to get to that thing that they need to heal about. Yes. And I think your interviews with them must have been extraordinary for them to finally have someone that said, well, what happened to you? And, and have someone maybe for the first time actually like the woman you mentioned actually be able to tell someone and because it's almost become so normal and obviously we had like the me too campaign and things like that some things become so normalized yeah. that they almost say in an offhand manner as you said like it wasn't really anything when actually it's shaped them as a person in an extraordinary way yeah, um, everybody always says the same thing i'm only ordinary i've got nothing i've got nothing I'm just ordinary, I've got no, I haven't got any stories to tell. And then you find out that, you know, they might have helped to dig out bodies from a bomb site or they helped to take over the tubes or or just the ordinary day-to-day stuff, drudgery, you know, trying to feed a huge family. So everybody, but I believe everybody has a story to tell. We all do, regardless of what generation we come from. You know, we all have a story to share. And I, I love that, you know, as, as you already said, it's a part of your research that you really enjoy. And you get to, you know, it's like an oral history, isn't it? You yes. get to find out all these extraordinary things that have happened to people. And one of the things that I've already mentioned to Kate is at the end of the book, I was all tearful. It was, it's just an extraordinary ending. I really enjoyed it. And like you've already talked sometimes that your character sort of go and veer off into <laughs> sort of the unknown. But when you when you began um, your book did you know how it would end did you know what those last scenes would be like right from the beginning pretty much yeah I'm a control freak I can't I, I, and it's funny because I've spoken to lots of author friends about this and, and I feel like we sort of fall into two camps we're either the plotter or the pantsters so if you're a pantster you just you have a general idea in your head you fly by the seat of your pants you sit down you start writing and your characters take you where they need to go but I am way too much of a control freak for that I'm not I'm not so bad that I cover my whole desk with like post-it notes but I have to know the story arc if you like I have to know where the, what my beginning and my middle and my end is so when I started I knew what was going to happen at the end um, and obviously if you, you don't want to control it so tightly that there's no room for any surprises you know your imagination has to be able to go off track and you know you have to be able to deviate from the journey and and, and things need to happen that you don't expect to happen but yeah, I have to know a beginning and a middle and an end. I'd be terrified. I would never start writing a book if I didn't know what the end Where it was going to go, how yeah, it was going to finish. <laughs> I'm not brave enough to do that. And also, I don't know about other authors, but I think it's quite a tight time scale. When you're writing a book a year, you are always juggling, you know, research with writing, with copy editing, with promotion. You know, you're constantly, it's a circular thing. So you're always juggling more or things at a time. So for me, it's like I have to be quite disciplined and I have to turn up. You know, once I've walked the, dropped the kids to school and walked the dog, I sit down at my desk, you know, 9, 9.30 and that's it. I'm in it until I've written a certain amount. You know, I can't, I never, there's no swanning off to writing retreats in Provence or waiting for the magic to happen. It's, a, it's hard graft writing. And I think I have to give myself the tools to help that. And structure is one of those for me. And a big part, as you were just describing there, Kate, is sort of bum on seat, yeah, right? No matter what you feel like, even if you're not, just 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 keep at it. And it's often when people have in live events have asked, you know, what would be good advice as a writer, and quite a lot of authors have said, right, um, right. you know, that's yeah. step one. There's and, no magic to it. <laughs> and and you said about Stephen King's book, the memoir book, which is excellent. And obviously, he's very much like that as well. He's like, you yeah. need to actually right um to. to become an author it's a job you know like i am a jobbing writer there is no magic there you know you just have to paint your bum with glue sit down and no matter how you're feeling right even if it's 50 words or sometimes most of the time it does end up a lot more than that but you have to be committed to it and you have to show up every day and and keep at it and i think that's the only way that books get written but that yeah. but that book by stephen king it was a revelation to me it was I don't know any wannabe writers out there you should you should read it it's, it's so clever about the craft of writing and it's completely made me um reevaluate the way I write and 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 sort of demystify the writing process if you like but that but, and, but that whole thing with writing with the door shut is the best advice ever because then you can begin to have a bit of fun with it 
if you take out the equation what you think people want to read and you know and just have fun with it and allow yourself to explore and and go off on tangents and that's the most wonderful thing I think and he does like you've already talked about Kate talk about that surrealness of when I think it's Kerry in the book when he he gets the you know the offer and he's like what you know like so it is it is really you know authors I think all have that experience and because when you said about a book of year a book a year a lot of people be like well a year that's loads of time but what I think often oh, people yeah. Don't, yeah it's really not what I think they often don't realize you say like you know that's not just you writing it that's the first draft the second draft the editing the yeah. proof writing it's a, the, the research yes. it's yeah. an, a, it's a massive yeah. undertaking to write a book and nobody tells you how to do it you have to sort of as an author there's nobody and that's one of the one of your questions is what do I like about being an author and I like not being micromanaged I like having autonomy and I like waking up each day and thinking right I'm going to go out to Stepney and interview and you know an elderly lady who worked at Yardley or or today I'm going to sit and write but you you have to sort of it's 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 a learning process and, it, and, and you have to understand how to temper that. So quite often my natural inclination is I love research and I love to put it all into the book. And I read a quite a painful review of the Lavender Girls the other day. A woman had said, oh, this author's really done her research. I thought, that's good. And she goes, but doesn't she want us to know it? And I thought, oh, no. Because oh, I put basically, I, and she was absolutely right. I've put, I'd done an information dump because I'd spent so long researching these, you know, these factories and, and these social histories. I put too much detail on the page and sometimes I think less is more and a lighter hand so that's a kind of constant learning curve for me how to to research it but not to include every last spit and cough on the page as it were but I, I would disagree with what they said because really? I love the book and I didn't find that at all really? but one, oh, well, I'm to hear I, it. it was it was fantastic and one of the things that I think and we've we talked about this me and Kate before we started this pre-recorded interview that you know you can't please everyone can no. you <laughs> there's there's always the one person that's like mm, didn't really like yeah. it and they want to tell everybody about it including the author that wrote it yeah. and you know it's quite brutal oh, to put yourself out in the world and I think you know it's really easy for people to try and tear you down and oh, um, you know because they might be people that don't put themselves out in the world and it's such a brave thing to become a published author as you said like to have your name on a book on Amazon god forbid where people <laughs> can be brutal <laughs> as anything <laughs> Um, but like obviously we've talked already about the fact that you were journalists for so many years did you find like when we said about this big process of writing a book did you find that helped because you know you're used to deadlines you're used to having to submit by a certain time yeah 100 percent. and I do think it, it well it is a good thing so far as you, yes you you have the fear of missing the deadline a friend of, uh, an author friend of mine we always laugh about this there is a reason why the word dead is in that word deadline it's quite dramatic isn't it you, yeah you feel like, I've I've thought of it like that. well i know but it is, it's quite a quite a dramatic word isn't it so no we never miss the deadline and when it comes to researching we'll put our whole heart into it and i think i won't ever just pick something up off the internet and accept that as given i'll go to trusted you know reliable sources and I think that publishers like the fact that journalists will do a thorough research job mm -hmm. um, that doesn't necessarily having said all that make journalists fantastic authors because all good stories all good books really are stories we need to be storytellers first and foremost but I definitely think that there are a lot of transferable skills from from working as a journalist and I still work as a journalist today I still write articles yeah. all the time because I love I love writing short stories. I love keeping my hand in as well. And I think it's it's a it's a good discipline to get into to going out and, and really listening to people. You know, one of the best pieces of advice I was ever given by my old editor was when you go out to interview people, just listen, actively listen. And if there's a silence, don't fill it. You know, and because they will fill it. And this is how you draw stories out. And so I try to to do that when I'm interviewing people for books or whether it's for articles for the newspapers so active listening is really important I think I love that and I'm, I'm sure that's where you got the the different layers from the people that you interviewed where they end up sharing very personal things which they may not have intended to yeah. but because of that skill that you've cultivated for these years that you can sit down with someone you can be present 
and as you say like actively listen to their story like it matters which yeah. as I said already like they may never have had anyone do that for yeah. them I which you're right and I think people would be you know surprised when you when you just sit with somebody and listen you know a lot of women will say oh I wasn't going to say that oh I've forgotten about that you know memory is such a funny thing shrouded isn't it and, 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 and sort of murky and I think sometimes you need the, the silence for the clarity and, and for the stories to kind of flow out so and I then she said remember that it sort of unfolds then doesn't it all of this this history and these extraordinary stories that people have experienced and you've already mentioned um Kate that you are a ghostwriter so you know our audience may not know what that is and <laughs> how, how would you how do you become a ghostwriter would you tell us a little bit about that so uh yeah it's a funny thing isn't it ghostwriter it makes you sound like you're just writing thrillers and spooky stories but Essentially, a, a lot of the memoirs or non-fiction books that you see on sale today will have been ghost-written, i.e. written by somebody else. So it was my job before I became a novelist, I would go out and, and I would interview people and I would have to, to write their story on their behalf. And one of my favourite books was a book called Aprons and Silver Spoons. And it was this incredible character called Molly Moran, a lady called Molly Moran. And she was 100 when I interviewed her. It was a penguin, and it was all about her life in service, um, in domestic service between the wars as a scullery maid. Um, and it was about the same time that Downton Abbey was on, so there was this real thirst for sort of domestic servitude and, and life below stairs, as it were. But the reason it worked so well was because Molly was just this incredible, you know, wickedly funny, quite naughty, rude lady <laughs> who just spent, you know, who when I went to interview her, she told me all the time about how the butler had a, a bum so tight you could bounce a penny off it and she was always <laughs> she was always sneaking out you know she used to sleep up in the attic in this grand house in Chelsea and she was always climbing shinning down the drain pipe so she could go off to a dance with the with the hall boy you know she had such a a full and rich and, and funny life and so it was wonderful that book and it actually that book went to number one on the Sunday Times bestseller and she was great because she was on this morning and joking with Philip Schofield about all the butlers and you know and she was quite a naughty sort of irreverent lady and, and it did really well so it was wonderful for me to see this 100 year old lady having a moment in the spotlight the oldest author i suspect to ever top the sunday times bestseller but what was really great about my story i think looking back is um and i loved I absolutely loved writing it but what i realized through Molly is that when she was working as a scullery maid she was basically skinny she was the lowest of the low i think she had like half a day off a month but then the Second World War came along and in one fell swoop decimated domestic service. And so she was, you know, she um, was conscripted, um, but she ended up in the service here, she became a rain, she married an officer, she travelled the world. So the war was a springboard out of drudgery for Molly. And it gave her freedom and, and autonomy and, and financial independence. And Molly went on to, to start in the very early days of the 60s, you know, in the 60s she started buying up houses and turning to hotels and renovating and selling them and so she ended up a very wealthy woman at the end of her life. And I think that's where the fascination came for for exploring women's lives during the Second World War and the incredible transformative effect that war had on women's lives. I gleaned that from Molly. And so it was really through doing Molly's book that I was discussing this with my agent and she said you should write a novel about this. So that's how ghostwriting sort of segued into into writing novels but I loved it I absolutely loved it because you know it's such a privilege to go to somebody like Molly's house and, and just spend you know we do it in chunks of time like you, you work around people like how they like to work and we would sit for a couple of days and, and interview and then I'd go off and write and then I'd come back again and and it's you have to try not to imprint your voice over theirs I mean she has such a strong character it would have been impossible anyway but but you are almost like a conduit, if you like. You are just the vessel for them to get their story to the page. Um, but I miss it. I love ghostwriting. And I'd love to go back to it someday. And I, I think what's what's really wonderful is, like, if you weren't doing that, her story would never have reached the world. So it's, as you say, like being that conduit to allow those extraordinary stories with the butler's bomb <laughs> to get out there. <laughs> the world where she can share all the adventures that she's been on I who mean, otherwise you know no one would ever know and I love how that sort of shifted into the ideas that you had around writing your own fiction books because it like fueled that fascination with strong women at the time with the journeys that they've gone through in their lives yeah so I'm enormously grateful for that opportunity to to ghostwrite but then I think 
being a journalist gave me that opportunity to go through it. So it always goes back to, to the listening of stories and to the unearthing of stories and exploring those stories. It always comes back to just being curious, I think, and going out and, and, and speaking to people. I think the best journalists and, and writers are those that are really curious about life and, and wanting to understand more about people's stories and the ability I, to listen. I was going to say, I love that, the, the, the idea of being curious about the world and people's lives, because it's fascinating, like when you watch, you know, um, another author I interview said that they people watch and yeah. go, oh, I wonder where they're going and what they've seen and what they're, yeah. and it, it's the what ifs, isn't it? You know, you get those core people. Yeah, essentially, like I will, I carry a notebook with me and if I'm on the bus and I hear a funny saying or a phrase, I write it down in my little notebook because you know, we're, we're story magpies, aren't we, I suppose? Don't yeah, we? absolutely. You know, tidbits and stories and anecdotes and funny words and phrases, you know. <laughs> And it's, as you say, it's all around us, like, you know, you get on the bus, you walk down the street, and um, because everyone has their own history, their own experiences, their own lives, their own turn of phrase and quirky sayings, you yeah. can, like, pull it all together and, and then create your amazing books. And yeah. but, but for you, Kate, like, what do you like reading? Is there a particular genre? And what are you reading right now? But I love historical fiction, obviously. I'm not so great with contemporary fiction, I think. I mean, I, I write what I love and, and therefore I read what I love. So I love um, Sarah Waters' um, The Night Watch is one of my favourite books, I think, and Tipping the Velvet and Fingersmith. She is just a master of, of that genre. She's so good at evoking details and immersing you. So I love, I love her books. I loved, um, you know, I like Ian McEwan Atonement. I love Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. I love, his, I love history. I like to walk the past streets and I think really good novelists can take you there. Having said all that, I am reading a book, um, and I'm going to really reveal myself to be completely stupid now because I can't—I don't know how you pronounce her surname. Jodie Picoult? Is it Picoult or Picoult? I think it's Picoult. I'm going to—I'm going to be like—I'm not sure. Um, I've just discovered I've never read any of her books, and obviously she's a massively um, successful, famous mm -hmm. author, and she's so brilliant. She's—I read this book called um, Storyteller. Is it Storyteller? Oh no, yes, the Storyteller by Jodie Picoult and it's such a clever premise for a book it's about a young Jewish woman who's working in a baker's um, in America I think you know in 2018 or whatever and this elderly German man comes into the baker's and she befriends him and they get talking and then he confides to her that during the war he was an SS officer working in one of the women's camps and he wants her to help kill him because oh my word then can his guilt be assuaged if he's if he's been you know killed by a Jewish woman so it's such a fantastic premise and then it's a dual narrative. It splits to her grandmother, who was in one of the women's in a concentration camp in the war. And she is such a skilled and, and humane storyteller. So I think I love, you know, I don't know about you, but over this last sort of year and a half through lockdown, I have read voraciously. I've, I'm, yeah. you know, I've read more than ever before. And I really see that around me. I see other people doing the same thing. You know, we're reading for escape and for solace and as in a means of sort of taking this, well, we can travel the world with a book where we can't actually travel the world. So I think that's the power of reading at the moment. And I don't know how many people listening to this would agree with that, but I, books have just been everything to me this last you know, year and a half or however long we've been going through COVID for. The last 20 years last or something. The last in my life, the last century is how it feels. It, yeah. it feels a lot longer than it actually has been oh, sometimes. It really, I think. it really does. But interesting enough, that, I don't know whether you're going to ask this question next, but that sort of is what, I've had so many parallels between COVID reading and wartime reading. So the book I'm writing at the moment is called The Little Wartime Library. Ooh, I was going to ask, like, what's, yeah, what's oh. next for you? <laughs> so the book, well, I, I'm not writing. I'm actually in the middle, middle of edit hell with it, but it, it will all be worth it in the, in the long run. So, yeah, Beth, The Little Wartime Library is based on the true story of what happened at Bethel Green Underground um, during the Second World War. And I love the surprises in history. So... On the first night of the Blitz, Bethel Green Central Library, um, a high explosive bomb dropped through the adult lending library. Um, and, you know, in a split second, this beautiful, well-ordered library was just cast into total decimation. And the borough librarian was a man named George Bale, and he had, his deputy was a man named Stanley Snaith. And I think they could have been forgiven for dragging a tarpaulin over the roof and rushing to the nearest shelter, but they didn't. You know, what they did, in their words, was to conduct this extraordinary pioneering social experiment so they salvaged 4,000 books from the burnt out library and they took them 78 feet below ground to Bethnal Green Underground, which at that time wasn't actually a working station. It was it was sort of um, it had been 
uh, building had been um, suspended at the outbreak of war, so it was a shelter at that point. And so they built, using a grant of £50 from Bethel Green Council, they built this perfect little wood panelled library over the tracks of the westbound platform of the central line. And I love, you know, I go down to Bethel Green Underground now and I see, you know, masked commuters and they're staring at the phone and I feel like shouting, them, there used to be a library on the tracks there, you know. That's amazing. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? And I think it's impossible to overstate what that library meant to people in sheltering at Bethel Green Underground during the Second World War, both in terms of sanctuary and solace and escapism you know I spoke to one woman who said oh she said when I was um, sheltering underground if I was knitting I could still feel the fear and I could still hear the bonds she said but when I had my head in a good book you know uh, real life melted away yeah and I and I've um, met this other fabulous woman called Pat Spicer who's now in her late 90s but she told me how when she was about 11 years old um, she pretty much lived down the underground you know that's the other staggering thing you've got to think about is that you know, whole childhoods rolled out seven to eight feet below ground at Bethel Green Underground. You know, the, the kids used to play kiss chase up the tunnels and, you know, it was entirely ordinary to sleep in a metal bunk bed below below Bethel Green. So, but she told me how, you know, in the evening she would wander along the tunnel and she would go into the little wartime library and she would borrow Millie Molly Mandy. That was her favourite book. Um, and she said, you cannot imagine, uh, you know, what that library meant to me when I was underground, you know, in, and she said it, it completely sparked this lifelong love of reading. And that sentence there, you know, when she said that completely hooked me in, I thought, wow, you know, this whole girl, the, the entire course of this girl's life was dictated by, was changed by the existence of that little library. And and I know that the, the borough librarian is definitely incredibly proud of what they'd achieved underground. And, and so I went along to Tower Hamlet's local history library archives and they'd left, being very organised librarians, they'd left copious written notes about the library and, you know, beautifully written about what it meant to them and photos of them. You know, they were there in their suits, pinstripe suits, stamping books. It was a really perfect library, just happened to be over the tracks of an underground. Um, it's extraordinary, really, that they did it. You know? But actually, you know, it, it, it's not so extraordinary because when I started to do wider research, I went along to the British Library and I pulled out the um, public library um records which is the wartime sort of magazine if you like and actually there were these little pop-up libraries everywhere you know St Pancreas um had a library van which they called a library to your door and they took library books to bomb sites to shelters to rest centers to barrage balloon sites you know these little libraries were popping up everywhere from prisoner of war camps to hospitals to troop ships to allotments you name it libraries you know, libraries boomed during the Second World War. You know, it's astonishing to think now because every, more or less every uh, borough has a library, but places like Putney and Staines didn't even have a library. So, but they quickly opened one in the Second World War. So we saw this, you know, libraries were really able to prove their worth during the Second World War and really cemented themselves as part of the community. And, and we saw that democratisation of libraries. And there was this fabulous study called by the Mass Observation Survey uh, study in 1942. And they realised that the whole new generation of working class women especially were enrolling into the libraries. And I think it was because there was this scarcity of paper and rationing and a lot of the Tupney libraries are closed down. People flocked to the library for the sort of escape that a good book can bring and because it was completely free and because libraries yeah. were really proving their worth, you know, and, and librarians then are like how I can see librarians behaving today. Now with the COVID, they were reactive, they were imaginative, resourceful, resilient, creative. And that's, so, so that's how I see librarians behaving today. So when I, so just tracking back a bit, actually, one of the things I realized when I was researching Little Wartime Library, um, I thought, oh my goodness, so the library, Bethel Green Overground Library, um, was go is gonna be celebrating its centenary, so 100 years. Uh, next year, uh, 2022, which was when the book comes out, the library opened in 1922. And I thought, well, why is there no events being planned? Why is nobody talking about this? You know, this is an incredible um, library. History, it's just history. such a rich why history. Why is nobody talking about it? And then unfortunately, the reasons became for that became quite clear. So as I, again, as I was researching, um, there were these sort of rumours emerging that, that Tower Hamlets um, were going, all the libraries known as idea stores are at threats of closure and cuts. And so one of the things on the table for Bethel Green was having its opening hours slashed by half and complete closure. So I got invited to join a campaign to save the library that was already up and running um, by a group in Tower Hamlets. And I thought about the ways that I could, what could I contribute? What could I do to, to play my part to help 
um, in this campaign. And so I wrote an article about Bethel Green Library and its extraordinary history and how it was really the symbol of resistance during the Second World War. And it appeared in, in the Guardian and, and actually the um, Library Association got in touch with me off the back of that. But then I thought, well, actually, what else can I do? And, I, and one of the perfect ways for me, loving social history and oral history was to, I thought, well, I'm going to interview 100 librarians or library workers to celebrate 100 years of the library. So that's what I'm doing. I've interviewed about 60 um, library workers so far, a great many from Suffolk, um, and I've still got 40 to go. But it's been a fascinating experience. And, and, and as I was conducting these interviews, a lot over Zoom because of the COVID crisis was unravelling, you know, I was speaking to librarians and they had been seconded and they were ringing around people on the NHS vulnerable list. And they were checking that people within their communities had food and medicine and, and, and those that sort of slipped between the cracks in society um, were being cared for. And it made me, and I realised, well, that's exactly what li librarians were doing in wartime. They were responding yeah. to the needs of their community and only in, in the way that only they know how. And it's made me realise I've got a fresh respect for librarians. I'm afraid I, so I, I kind of subscribe to that slightly archaic view that librarianship was quite a sedate, quiet profession. And now I totally see that librarians and library workers are frontline workers. You know, they're used to dealing yeah. with the disenfranchised and the vulnerable and the mentally ill. And, um, you know, and often a librarian might be the only person that someone sees all day. So they play this incredible multifaceted role that means to me they're, they're incredibly talented. They've got such a diverse range of skills. And... You know, if, my, if libraries are microcosms of society, which they definitely are, the librarian is ultimately a humanitarian. And I think in the way that libraries are so much more than repositories of books, librarians are so much more than people that, you know, recommend books and convey information. They are, yeah, I mean, they're people lovers, really. That was the other thing I yeah. noticed, first and foremost. They love people. And it was one of your lovely library workers, a lady called Charlotte, um, who said to me, you know, librarians require infinite patience and politeness in the face of adversity. And she told me she, she works at Southwold and she said, Yeah, I love I love Charlotte. She's, she's fantastic. Great. She said, a love of people is as, if not more important than a love of books. And that totally struck home. So yeah. I yeah, it's been an amazing experience interviewing all these library workers and finding all these incredible stories and and like, like a lady um, who I expect to be called Denise from uh, Tower Hamlets, who worked for many years in Whitechapel, and she said, you know, Kate, if you want to see the world, don't join the army, become a librarian. <laughs> I <laughs> love that. How right that is. How <laughs> true. Um, and when you said about Charlotte, like the library, uh, one of um, 44 libraries in Southwold is lovely. I have spent a day working there with Charlotte. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the community, the mm -hmm. what, what libraries bring, I think, can often be... You know, it isn't always seen. It's sometimes just that we just stamp books. But yeah. as you say, it's, it's almost that resilience of women. Because it's, I mean, obviously there are men that work within libraries, but it is predominantly women heavy in library services, in the library services yeah. I've worked in, surely. Yeah. And for us to continue, it's such an important hub for the community. And we offer so many services. And I just, personally, it's why I've got such a massive passion for knowledge, which is what, you know, over a decade ago, why I started working with libraries. Yeah, yeah. Oh, because... I need to interview you. Sorry? I need to interview you, but I do need to interview you. <laughs> <laughs> well it's what well, he was just saying you know it's the place to be really isn't it because as well as as you said the escapism during the war and during covid times or fiction you know you've got this extraordinary place where you can learn pretty much everything and anything from a book or from one of our online we've got an online course um, that's free courses that are free in Suffolk for um, customers and the opportunities that libraries bring I think are just immeasurable and I, I love everything you've said there thank you so much Kate that's, that's just awesome realize. it's so true I never realized and I think you're right because I think women librarians have the emotional intelligence to navigate all those you know issues that unexpected things that crop up day to day because you get this great wash of humanity coming in through the doors and you never know what you're presumably what each day will bring and who you're going to have to cope with absolutely it is it's very much you never know what's going to come through the door what's going to happen and how ultimately we might be able to help people like you know that's a big passion yeah. i think for all library services as well as suffolk that as you say it's it's around making a difference yeah and you know we you do that I, I can't I mean I can't see that there's any other space within a society quite like a library that is 
that is neutral, that is, you know, free, is safe. It's the only place you can go from cradle to grave. And you can just sit there. You don't even actually have to read a book and you don't have to part with a penny. No. There's nowhere else like that, is there? In the community? It's totally accessible and, it's you know, very passionate about that. I, you know, gosh, I could talk for hours about well, we how much I love to, libraries. I'm going to have to interview, I, I, on all seriousness, I would love to interview because every time you speak to a, or I speak to a library work, I, I learn something new and uh, not not just, you know, a, a practical level, there are stories, but also the, the passion and the love that goes into libraries and how they are really an extension of like a community living room in a sense aren't they for a lot of people you know I, I, I absolutely the stories a lot of which I've funneled into the little wartime library and when you know this amazing book you've been researching when we we likely to see that available for people well, is it a little way still well not to, oh, it's going so fast isn't it I think it's coming out in library hardback first in the spring of 2022 so next Excellent. early next year so I'm just editing it at the moment it's massively over length um, <laughs> and I've started each chapter with a, with a quote from a library worker, um, which is a bit weird because it's, it's in the current day and then you go back to 1940. But I quite like that juxtaposition of, you know, the continuation that actually what library workers are doing now is not so fundamentally far removed from what people were doing in wartime. So I think it helps to link it all up. So, yeah, early next year, um, spring 2022, um, it's going to come out. That is fantastic. Any luck, we're going around all the, as many libraries as I possibly can to promote it so I'd definitely like to come down to Suffolk. Oh we'd love that that would be amazing and I've obviously we've been talking a lot today about Kate's latest book that is already out which Secrets of the Lavender Girls it's super uh, awesomely superb I thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed it it's Thank got you. you know get your tissues ready for the ending <laughs> um, but really beautiful and lots of really great topics and feisty strong women are explored um do check it out if you haven't it's it's really fantastic and you know i'd just like to finish by thanking everyone for joining us um, at this pre-recorded event as a charity suffolk libraries are so grateful for your support from attending great events like this to borrowing our books because we are now back open and of course donating to us you can find out more about our services and ways to support us on our website and to be the first to hear about all our upcoming author events do join our online facebook group discover reads and you'll find the link to the group under this video you can also find details of our online events on our suffolk libraries website and eventbrite page thank you all again for joining us and of course a huge thanks to you kate it's been such a pleasure oh, talking God. to you i could spend all day lovely. so could i i think you and i could talk long into the night i'm so grateful for you and for the support from suffolk libraries i love suffolk libraries and i can't wait to get down in person and meet you all properly but thank you so much for having me on